In today's lab, we are following an experiment that demonstrates the synthesis of an asymmetric ether by using the Williamson ether synthesis organic reaction. This organic reaction was developed by a scientist called Alexander Williamson in 1850, so it's named after him. And it was a very important reaction in the history of organic chemistry because it helped prove the structure of ethers. This reaction is followed by an SN2 reaction between an alkoxide and an alkyl halide type molecule where you have a very good leaving group in order to form an ester. Williamson ether synthesis is an SN2 type reaction, which means substitution by a nucleophilic attack, which is occurring between two molecules. And the two types of molecules that can participate in this reaction is either sodium alkoxide or sodium phenoxide against either alkyl halides, alkyl sulfonates, or alkyl sulfates. You can see that each of these molecules, alkyl halide, alkyl sulfonate, and alkyl sulfate, all have very strong leaving groups. So this allows for a concerted attack by a nucleophile to this carbon, allowing a new molecule to form. Over here, how do we produce the sodium alkoxides or sodium phenoxides? We react the alcohol version of this molecule with a strong base like sodium hydroxide in order to make this alkoxide version. The reason we use the alkoxide or a phenoxide, which is made by a phenol reacting with a strong base like sodium hydroxide, is that this group will serve as a stronger nucleophile compared to how it would be if it was just an OH group. In today's reaction, we are going to use a phenoxide over here ethyl, a uh, 4 ethyl phenoxide reacting with a sulfonate, an alkyl sulfonate, ethyl p toluene sulfonate, in order to prepare an asymmetric ether product by the Williamson ether synthesis reaction. In the first step, we have 4 ethyl phenol so you can see it has the OH group, and phenol is a slightly acidic molecule, so it can react with a strong base like sodium hydroxide simply in an acid-base type reaction. So when an acid and base reacts, we get it's the conjugate base form of the acid and we get water. So once we react these two, we get 4 ethyl phenoxide salt. So now you can see that we have a much stronger nucleophile prepared as a phenoxide salt. Then this over well here is going to react with ethyl P toluene sulfonate. So this part is going to act as the leaving group, and that gives the opportunity for this oxygen to attack this carbon. So let's draw the lone pairs of the oxygen again. So what happens is the 
This group will leave, taking the electrons that it shared with this carbon over here, and in its place comes this nucleophile and substitutes this part instead of sodium. So over here, we get this new ether product, 1-ethoxy-4-ethylbenzene. So you can see that this part is now attached here to the oxygen. And once this olivine group leaves, it's going to be basically a sulfonate ion which is going to form an ion pair with the sodium ion that was previously uh, paired with the 4-ethylphenoxide cell. So basically, this is the whole reaction uh, that is happening in the experiment we are learning of today. In the next couple of slides, I'm explaining the procedure and help you understand what is going through each step. So first of all, we have phenol mixed with 25% NaOH. We add them together in a while. We put a spin ring and we spin to dissolve the phenol solid in this aqueous 25% NaOH solution. So they're going to have an acid-base reaction and will produce 4-ethylphenoxide. After that, we are going to add the alkyl sulfonate, which is going to react with the phenoxide when SN2 type reaction so the appropriate amount of ethyl p toluene sulfonate will be added. And we are also adding this molecule called TBAB. It's tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. So the whole purpose of this molecule is to serve as a catalyst. And it's not like a normal catalyst we see, but it's a type of catalyst we call a phase transfer catalyst. So if you were asked what is the purpose of TBAB, in this reaction, it is to serve as a phase transfer catalyst and facilitate the reaction between 4-ethylphenoxide and ethyl p toluene sulfonate. Once we add all the reagents together in a while, we are going to fix it into this condenser and fix it to a drying tube. So this drying tube simply has two cotton plugs and in between some calcium chloride in order to absorb moisture or whatever other gases that might come through it. And in this condenser, we have water coming in from the bottom faucet and water leaving from the top faucet. Why do we use a condenser and why do we call this a refluxing? If you think about it, if you had this reaction while with your reagents in there and you supplied heat to cause the reaction to happen, if we just left it open to the environment, this solution is eventually going to evaporate. But if we fix a condenser to it and then allow the reaction to happen, whatever liquids that vaporize, it's going to be cooled down once it moves up in this condenser, form droplets, 
and fall back into the reaction well because the water coming in and flowing out is going to absorb whatever heat from this vapor causing them to condense. So this refluxing is a method where we use this cooling condenser system in order to maintain the reagent volume within a while but when we have to heat it for a long period of time in order for the reaction to happen. So that would be something you should remember. Why do we need to reflux? Okay, next, let's look at what's going on in the reaction while. So, ethyl p toluene sulfony, you can see um, over here, it's kind of a neutral molecule, even though there are some oxygen in it, it's a neutral molecule, and it has this bulky uh, hydrocarbon parts to it. Oh, here, this bulky hydro hydrocarbon parts attached to it. So the polarity from this part of the molecule is not enough to make it soluble in an aqueous solution. So it's going to exist in the organic phase. And the 4-ethyl phenol side, as you can see, it's an ionic molecule, and ionic molecules are able to form strong interaction with aqueous solutions, so it's going to be soluble in the aqueous phase. So the reaction, while, if you think about it, um, if you mix some oil in water and mix it, it's going to form kind of an emulsion, right? There will be oil droplets floating in the water or the aqueous solution. So there will be an aqueous phase in organic phase. Now we see a problem here because this region is existing in the aqueous phase, while this region is existing in the organic phase. And for a reaction to happen, reagent molecules need to come into contact, right? But how would we make that happen if they're in two different phases? So that's why we use that phase transfer catalyst called TBAB, tetrabutyl ammonium bromide, which has an ionic property to it as well as a hydrocarbon property to it. So this side is polar and this side of the molecule is nonpolar. So it can exist in the surface between the aqueous phase and the organic phase and then attract each of these molecules towards the interface so they can react with each other. So this will cause the molecules to come near the interface so the reagents will interact with each other and then produce the ether product that we are looking for, 1-ethoxy-4-ethylbenzene, and the side product, sodium p toluene sulfonate. As you can see, this is a salt-type molecule, and this will actually form a salt precipitate. So at the end of the reaction, we will have 1-ethoxy-4-ethylbenzene and the salt precipitate. And if some of these reagents were left over, then that would be available too. 
Once the reaction is done, we have to isolate our product from the reaction mixture. So I drew like this ether product would probably exist like a few oil droplets floating on an aqueous space. And you will see some precipitate, which is that sodium P, uh, is it sodium P toluene sulfonate. So we're going to isolate the product via extraction. If you think about it, it's really hard to draw out these little uh, bubbles or the oil droplets by a pipette. So what we're going to do is we're going to form a clear layer of organic phase versus aqueous phase by adding two mils of diethyl ether. So diethyl ether is an organic solvent we add it and our ether product will readily dissolve in diethyl ether. Now we are going to have a very clear organic phase and an aqueous phase. So this is much easier to visualize and easier to work with. Once we mix this, we're going to put a pipette in and draw out the aqueous layer. Then we're going to add a one mil of water to dissolve that sodium P toluene sulfonate precipitate. So it's going to dissolve in the aqueous layer because it's a salt. And again, we remove the aqueous layer. Next, we're going to wash the organic layer with 5% sodium hydroxide. The reason for that is if there were some phenol that had not reacted initially, that is going to interfere with our isolation because this is also a neutral uh, molecule with a large hydrocarbon quotient, so it's going to mix in the same organic phase as our ether product. So if we isolate it like that, our product will not be pure. So to make sure that there are no photophenol left in the organic phase, we're going to react it with 5% NaOH. You can see that initially we used 25%. Now we are using a much dilute solution because there's probably very little photophenol uh, left, if any, in the organic phase. So again, we will see an acid Base reaction and it will be converted to full ethyl phenoxide, which is an ionic molecule due to these charges, and ionic interactions are strong enough to drag this nonpolar part and everything into the aqueous layer. So if there was some photophenol left here, it will react with the sodium hydroxide, become an ionic molecule, and move to the aqueous layer. And when we remove the aqueous layer, we are removing the leftover photophenol. I hope this makes sense. So after that's done, we are going to wash the organic layer with one to two mils of water. Why do we do this? There can always be a few droplets of aqueous layer trapped in the organic layer. But if we wash it with a bulk of water, since like dissolves in like, these water droplets will be easily drawn into 
the water that we are washing with. So we are kind of removing traces of water from the organic layer. Finally, we are going to do another step to remove any traces of water from the organic phase, which we call drying the organic layer. Drying means here is removing any any presence of water from the organic layer using anhydrous sodium sulfate. Anhydrous means it's very dry and it can it's highly absorbing moisture. And sodium sulfate is a salt, right? So salt can absorb water, so we add sodium sulfate in here. So if there were any more traces of water that was in the organic layer, that will be absorbed by the anhydrous sodium sulfate. So that is the purpose of using anhydrous sodium sulfate. Once we are sure our organic layer is dried, we're going to pass it through a filter pipette and collect it to a pre-weighed 10 ml flask, a 10 ml beaker. with a boiling chip in it. And we're going to collect this organic layer in here. The reason we pass it through this filter pipette is when we draw out the organic layer, some particles of the sodium sulfate might be uh, drawn out with it. So whatever those particles will be trapped by the cotton plug here and we'll get a filtered organic layer. So remember this organic layer is a mixture of diethyl Ether and our ether product is one ethoxy ethyl benzene. So it's a mixture of these two. So what we want to isolate is just the one ethoxy ethyl benzene. That's the product we're interested in. So how are we going to get rid of the diethyl ether? which we only use to facilitate the extraction process. We're going to gently heat the solution collected in the 10 ml beaker. And I have here the boiling points of each of these uh, compounds. So for diethyl ether, the boiling point is 34.6 Celsius. And the boiling point of one ethoxy for the Benzene is 211.4 Celsius. So if we gently heat this, all the diethyl ether is going to quickly evaporate and the one ethoxy ethyl benzene will be left as a residue. Usually we add this boiling chip to avoid aggressive bubbling. So the bubbles will be formed around the boiling chip and released in a more, uh, I should say like released in a non-aggressive way so we won't lose any of our product. So once all the diethyl ether is evaporated, we will have a residue of one ethoxy ethyl benzene left and we can Weigh this again and subtract the pre weight to get the weight of 
ether product. So at this point, we are going to use this residue, uh, dissolve a little bit of it in dichloromethane and use the liquid uh, solution prep uh, for IR analysis using the salt plate method and get an IR spectrum. And in the IR spectrum, we should see like if this was the IR spectrum, we should see a strong peak for CO stretch and some peaks that represents the aromatic group and uh, also see SP3X stretch likewise. If for some reason there was some phenol left in this final isolated product, you will get an OH peak. So what if you obtain an IR spectrum for your final product and it looked like this? This would mean that there's still some phenol left in your final isolated product, so it's not pure. So what can you do to purify your product or improve the purity of your product? You can redissolve this uh, product in diethyl ether and wash a few more times with 5% NaOH to convert all of the remaining phenol into the phenoxide so it will dissolve in the aqueous phase and then you can remove it. Finally, uh, I'd like to discuss about calculating the theoretical yield. So the two reagents that are important for this, like the measurements are important, is phenol and ethyl p toluene sulfonate. Here's their molecular weights, and these are the amounts that the procedure tells us to measure. So how do we get the required weight that we need to weigh? We get that by multiplying the number of moles by the molecular weight. So for example, we need to measure 146.4 milligrams of phenol, And we need to measure 240 milligrams of ethyl p toluene sulfonate. The amount of TBAB is not that important because it doesn't participate in the reaction. It only serves as a phase transfer catalyst. So it's not taking part in any chemical reaction, so we don't need to worry about that. So these are some example numbers. So just remember, this is only an example. Let's say we measured 150 milligrams and we measured 138 milligrams. So these were not exactly the amounts that we were supposed to weigh, right? That happens in reality. So we have to go back and calculate the actual number of moles that we weighed out. How do we do that? We divide this weight by its molecular weight, and now we have the actual number of moles we measured. We do the same thing here. So now we have 1.2295 millimoles of phenol and 1.19 millimoles of ethyl p toluene sulfonate. So remember, this is only for, an, uh, only for the purpose as an example to show you how this works. You should get the actual readings by watching the experiment video. 
So this is the main Williamson ether synthesis reaction. The photophenoxide reacts with ethyl ptoluene sulfonate to give the ether product that we want. This photophenoxide was formed uh, depending on the amount of photophenol that we added. If we assume 100% of the photophenol was converted into photophenoxide, that means we have 1.2295 millimoles of photophenoxide. And we added 1.19 millimoles of ethyl ptoluene sulfonate. And if we look at the stoichiometric ratio, molar ratio, in which each of these reagents react to form the product, the molar ratio is 1 to 1 to 1. So if we react 1 millimole of this with 1 millimole of this, we should theoretically get 1 millimole of the ether product. Let's say we had, again, example, 2 millimoles of this, but 1 millimole of this, then this number acts as the limiting reagent or the limiting number, and that decides that, that decides the theoretical number of moles that we can get for our ether product. So based on the example numbers I got from the previous slide, we had 1.2295 millimoles of photophenoxide, 1.19 millimoles of ethyl ptoluene sulfonate. So in this example, ethyl ptoluene sulfonate was the limiting reagent and that will decide how many moles of 1-ethoxyphotobenzene that we can theoretically obtain. So that would be 1.19 millimoles. Then how do we calculate the theoretical yield? The yield should always be given as a weight. To get the theoretical yield of one ethoxyphotobenzene, we multiply the number of moles times the molecular weight of the one ethoxyphotobenzene. So the number of moles that we can theoretically get is 1.19 millimoles times the molecular weight 150.22 grams per mole this is the theoretical yield that we are looking for. The actual yield of the product we got by experiment, experimentally weighing the difference between the 10 mil vial in the beginning and after uh, evaporating the diethylether. So that's the actual weight. weight. And the per person yield will be the actual yield or theoretical yield times 100%. So you are able to calculate the person yield. If your person yield is very low, that means you have to improve uh, your techniques in the experiment in order to get a higher yield. So that's all I wanted to explain for this lab. If you have any questions, we can discuss them.